Hi. This video is all about how we can establish a time scale for the climatic changes that define the quaternion. Now, it is possible to apply all our usual techniques of relative dating to quaternary sediments. But if we're going to understand particularly the rate and the duration of climatic changes, it's going to be important to actually quantify the timescales involved. And with the quaternary, we have a particular issue with the short duration and the precision required of any dating technique that we're going to employ. Now clearly, radiometric dating is going to be important as a technique in the quaternary. Here are four um, selected uh, decay curves for different um, radioactive isotopes. Now, most of these isotopes have extremely long half-lives, particularly when we compare it with the duration of the quaternary and our requirement to date um, geological events that may only last for thousands or maybe even only hundreds of years. The isotope that gives us a relatively short duration of half-life, and therefore the possibility for a very accurate date, is carbon-14. Now carbon is a very common element in our biosphere. There are three isotopes of carbon that make up virtually all of the carbon around us. Carbon-12 is the vast majority of this. Carbon-13 is maybe about 1% of this. And carbon-14 occurs in these tiny trace amounts. It's actually created in the upper atmosphere where cosmic rays uh, alter nitrogen-14 by neutron capture and turn it into carbon-14. This carbon-14 disperses, disperses itself through the atmosphere and is absorbed by all living things. Plants will absorb this. Uh, we then eat plants, or animals eat plants. Um, so we're constantly absorbing this tiny amount of carbon-14. There's some uh, of this isotope in all of us. Although that carbon-14 will be uh, decaying, it's also still being ingested. Once the organism dies, though, this exchange stops. And the process that takes over is the, decay, the radioactive decay of that carbon-14. Now this uh, decays with a half-life of 5,730 years, or thereabouts. Relatively short geologically. Now, because of the unique way in which carbon-14 is created, we can't use the parent-daughter ratio to determine the age of these samples. What we have to do is compare the carbon-14 ratio with the other non-radioactive isotopes that we get within the sample. You can see from this decay curve that once we have been through a number of half-lives, somewhere between eight and 10 half-lives, we have very, very, very little of our original carbon-14 uh, left. Almost immeasurably small uh, amounts of the parent material left. The result of this is that the maximum age we can date a uh, geological material for is about 60,000 years. We can't really push it back beyond that. Now clearly 60,000 years geologically is a very, very, very limited amount of time. So the use 
of carbon-14 dating is mostly archaeological. But there are a few very particular geological applications for this technique. In particular, it allows us to establish timescales for the end of the last glacial period and the beginning of our current interglacial period. By dating things like pollen, seeds, plants from peat bogs, we can come up with that time scale of the most recent climatic changes. Now there are some issues with this. There is a little uncertainty with the length of half-lives. There's always the uh, possibility of the loss of some of the daughter atoms. There is, particularly with carbon-14, an issue with uh, contamination. This material is still around us in the atmosphere. It's still in the people who are actually doing the tests, which is, I think, far more of an issue with this technique than it would be, say, with rubidium strontium. And, of course, with very, very small measurements, as we're pushing the ages back towards that 60,000-year limit, we can end up with very, very small uh, materials, which does make it challenging to measure these things. Now, there are a few other ways that we can uh, try and date quaternary materials. We, can call, we call these incremental dating techniques because they allow us to count up, um, if you like, the product of annual events. Now, this can be sediment, uh, a sedimentary event. Uh, these are what we call varve deposits. This is an annual layer of sediment that's deposited, often in um, sort of proglacial lakes, where in the winter uh, a, lake, uh, a lake may be frozen and we'll just get deposition of extremely fine grain material. In the spring, uh, with the snow melt, uh, there'll be a, an influx of of energy from the streams uh, coming off the glaciers, and that will wash in a layer of coarser material. So through a year, we'll get a cycle of fine-grained and coarser-grained sediments. We can count these up, and that will give us an indication of the duration of deposition in a particular sequence. As we can see in this photograph here. There are examples of this uh, from here in Wales. We can see uh, in this case some very fine-grained uh, sediments, but the, with the grain size changing on a cyclic scale. What do you think could have deposited this? It is possible to calculate some of the changes that we'll see. If you calculate the um, average thickness of laminations there in zone X and compare them to the other two. What do you think may be the reason for this? Can you see a change even just in the graph? What other interpretations could geologists make of this data? Another incremental technique that's used is dendrochronology. This uses a biological annual cycle, where in temperate climates we see uh, the growth of trees, um, the, well, the rate of the growth of trees changing through the year. We can count then annual rings, and we can use the pattern of, this, of these rings to actually work out when this tree was alive. 
you'll notice on the image here there are varying thicknesses of uh, the rings depending on the, the weather conditions in that particular year. That creates a, a unique pattern over time. By measuring these and by looking for this pattern and comparing it with a, uh, a known um, or material of known age, we can work out the exact years that this tree was alive. Now, its use again is far more archaeological than geological, but its key contribution to what we do is this will actually calibrate carbon 14 dating. We can look uh, to use samples from wood of a known age to measure variations in the production of carbon-14 in the atmosphere. It allows us to come up with a more precise date. It can also be used as a climatological evidence and as I said, archaeologically, uh, for art history and building history, it can give exact dates for when things were made. The final type of dating that we need to consider is what we call isochronous marker beds. These are marker beds that are laid down at the same time. That's what isochronous means. What we're really talking about here are volcanic ashes. When a volcano erupts, it can deposit ash across a wide area. That ash will have a unique um, signature of trace elements within it. It also can be radiometrically dated using a variety of different methods. And because that layer is spread out over a wide area, it gives us a point in a sequence where we can put a precise date. This allows us to date material that's older than the um, maximum limit for carbon-14 dating. So it's an extremely useful technique within the quaternary, particularly for older um, sequences, even in, also in ice cores, because of course we can have volcanic ash deposited uh, in a sequence uh, of ice. The example given here is an old example, going back into the uh, Cretaceous period. But the concept, the idea behind it is exactly the same as what we use in the quaternary. We can find um, examples of this uh, here in the UK. Uh, the eruption of volcanoes in Iceland is well documented and can be well dated. Um, and we can find um, not only these layers within Iceland, but we can also find uh, evidence of these deposited across Northern Europe. It gives us key dates, um, key points in time that we can then um, measure the rest of a sequence from. does allow us as well, giving us this, this fixed point in time to show any regional differences in when climatic change occurs by comparing this with other types of climate proxy data. It's an extremely useful technique. Although, it, of course, it only gives us the exact date for where the marker horizon is, not every part of the sequence. So, to conclude, there are different techniques that we use, need to use for quaternary dating because of the increased level of precision. Carbon-14 dating is extremely useful, but only for the last 60,000 years. Beyond that, it's of no use to us as geologists. So for that limited period of time, it gives us 
a superb time scale to measure climatic changes. Beyond that, we need to rely on other methods, such as the incremental dating methods. Although, again, that can be limited. Even for um, trees like this, this is a bristlecone pine tree from California, the oldest living thing on Earth. That only goes back eight, 9,000 years. Using volcanic ash as an isochrone uh, across a region gives us a reliable way of dating, going much further back in time. But it will only give us those pinpoint uh, points in the section where the ash occurs. Don't forget to come up with your interesting question and bring it along to class. I'll see you then.